Welcome to the Growing With Fishes podcast. I'm Steve. And uh, we Mark. also have fish. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Marty. I was muted. <laughs> this, was a botched, this was a botched beginning to a podcast. I don't think we've got one right yet, honestly. If it doesn't start with my bong hit or Scotty screwing up or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, today more than usual. That's what you need. And I'm Fish Ganja Guy. Good morning. Oh, yeah. Him too. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, we had some technical issues with the guy from Kapow. Um, he had some, we had some problems trying to get his audio straightened out. So we're going to have him on the show next week. And we're just going to do a little bit shorter show this week um, because of it. So apologize for that. He will be on the show next week. Um, but unfortunately, we just... That's why we're starting almost half an hour late. We were trying to get it to work, and it just was not working. So he, uh, we figured out what the problem is, but unfortunately, it's hardware-related. So um, he's going to grab that, get that straightened out, and then we'll uh, we'll have it all next week. So apologize for that, guys. Anyways, what uh, what have you guys been up to? Uh, Marty, your stories are probably a little less sad than mine, so why don't you start off? <laughs> all right. Um, so today we... And uh, I'm going to switch it into flower here in the garden for you guys that haven't been far along. But I'm going to check out my YouTube channel, uh, which is AP Meds. Um, and so I'm going to switch into flowers. So I always release some uh, beneficial insects when I switch into flower. So um, when I was talking to him, the guy about it today, I was talking to him about the podcast that I was doing tonight. And, the YouTube channel, and uh, I go and I talk to him all the time. They have an aquaponics system there in the front, and uh, he's always been, been curious, and he grows outdoor in soil, um, but also, you know, enjoys aquaponics uh, just there at the shop and sells some supplies for it, so we've talked before. So anyway, when I told him, uh, you know, what I was doing, he offered to donate some bugs and came back out with, like, a whole bag full of different types of beneficial insects. So there's beneficial nematodes, uh, white fly parasites, um, uh, spider mite destroyer bugs, uh, green lacewigs, um, all kinds of different stuff he gave me. So I spent the afternoon shooting videos and um, releasing those. So that's been been kind of fun. And uh, so that's why you see me. You see me dodging. I'm getting dive bombed by ladybugs. We just re released a bunch of them earlier today, so uh, that's that's been taking up my time here in the garden. Other than like getting stuff transplanted, I had a bunch of uh, transplants I picked up last week. Um, after I tore out all of those uh, platinum Girl Scout cookies that uh, um, that uh, hermed out, so they hermaphroditized. So I had to kill all those, pull them out, and replace them with plants from somewhere else. And uh, anytime you bring them in, whether it's from a dispensary or for me, it was friends that I picked up plants from. Um, but if it's the strawberry plants from the co-op or the farmer's market, just pretty much assume they're going to bring some type of bug with them. Um, so I, I always treat it that Especially way. Especially strawberries. Yeah, I was going to say yeah, strawberries are notorious for spider mites. Spider mites. Yeah, I, I actually said that in my video when I was talking about it earlier. Uh, you know, I don't think I've ever seen a strawberry plant uh, come from any sort of nursery, co-op store, public place of any kind that didn't have uh, spider mites happily living on it. So. Um, so anytime you bring in plants from the outside, I recommend doing it. And since I just brought in like 20 of them, uh, you know, definitely wanted to do that. No, I had already went through and sprayed with Nukem um, multiple times. And then I usually give it about three days after that. Have uh, you had any luck with Nukem? Because I've never had luck with Nukem. Yeah, I, it, it's killed pretty much everything. I even put it through the microscope test. I like to, um, I think I have one of those uploaded on my channel right now, which is just a, you know, I take the microscope and um, set it up, my camera up, so that I can I can see through it or and and view them um, and just kind of move the slide around. But uh, so I'll I'll set it up where I can see live spider mites on the plant, and then spray the stuff on there and and uh, um, just record and. Friends, them. 
Yeah, so Nukem uh, definitely knocked out everything I've sprayed it on from aphids. Now, I don't have any, I in, I'm going to knock on like every piece of wood I've had, but I've never had any russet mites here. I've had two-toed spider mites. I've had, um, you know, like sort of the orangish ones. I forget what they're called. Uh, but I've um, mostly two-toed or two-spotted mites, sorry, two-spotted mites um, is mostly what I, I end up with in here. I've had aphids, I've had white flies, but only once. Um, fungus gnats, obviously, uh, you know, I've had from time to time. And, uh, but yeah, for the most part, I would say the, the two-spotted is the main spider mite I deal with. And usually I use like triple threat uh, predator mites as well, but he was out of stock of those. And uh, I'm going to stop back by next week when he gets those in, and he's going to have around another bugs uh, of different ones. He has some pirate bugs, um, some more spider mite destroyers. And uh, so, yeah, he, a, a number of different ones uh, that he wants to um, just sort of get some promotion done on. So um, now is a, a big time of year because it's starting to warm up. So people are getting their outdoor gardens kind of put together and um, so it, it's a good time of year to start thinking about probably a little bit early still to release them outside but if you have a greenhouse it would be a great time to release them but uh, start thinking about what what bugs you want and sort of you know so you start stocking things like amendments and that kind of stuff for the I mean just hundreds of outdoor growers that live around here so um, they, he has a great place there and he donated all of these bugs here so that we could shoot videos and just learn how to use them so uh, definitely cool him. So if you guys need any beneficial insects, you can go to his website, which is uh, naturescontrol.com. And uh, there's a phone number right on there. Lots of information about the bugs themselves. Um, you know, they do a great job on shipping. And, uh, you know, they've shipped across the country everything from ladybugs to different kinds of stuff. And uh, Nathan over there can answer any questions you have about, uh, you know, what you should use and when you should use them. And, Obviously, using them all at the same time, like I did today, is not, you know, not ideal. Um, but you know, we I wanted to show show people how to use them, and uh, get sort of just each one of them shot. Um, so right now, the the main issue is that a lot of them are going to eat each other. So the ladybugs are going to eat the green lacewood eggs, and you know, back and forth. So I call it bug wars. I usually release a couple of them at a time, not not this many varieties, but. Uh, so that, um, you know, it was just really cool overall to have them do that and to learn about all this different stuff because I didn't know about half of them when I started. So you know, releasing how and understanding how like the this right here is a praying mantis egg. I don't know if you guys can see that very well or not, but that's going to release you know one to two hundred praying mantis here in a few weeks. So I got a couple of those. I got three of those. The, One of them I already have set out. The praying mantises are kick-ass for, say you have just a couple of plants or a small area. They tend to do with, you know, a six six by six or ten by ten area where they'll cover pretty good, especially for caterpillars or other larger stuff. They really kick ass, but they don't, you know, they're very localized. They generally don't roam around quite as much as some of the other insects, especially if they have a good food source. Um, right. But they're great for greenhouses, and and you can even use them uh, in the specific parts of your garden. And they do, you know, will generally stay in that area pretty well, at least in the beginning. What's the smallest uh, scale of room that you would recommend having a, a couple praying mantis in? Um, I mean, I don't. You could do them in a big tent. I mean, they're they're overkill, and a lot of them are going to eat each other. But it just depends on what kind of insects you're fighting, you know. Well, I mean, yeah. like preventative, like they'll just eat on the ladybugs while they're waiting for some spider mites or something to show up. Yep, I'll be right back. Good. Yeah, two seconds or each other. Just something. Yeah. You, know, you definitely want to spread them out if you want to keep too many of them. Like you, you'll get a lot of them that hatch, but if you don't spread them out, they're just going to start killing each other right away. Yeah, just one in each three by three bed. That's all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna when they start hatching, I'm gonna start spreading them out. I have four different systems, so I ha I have two indoors and two outdoors, and then uh, I have some garden beds, soil beds as well. So 
my my plan is to keep an eye on them and do updates on them and kind of hopefully i'll be able to uh, once i get an idea of when one of them is going to hatch so here's my plan so i'm going to keep two of them in here in about the same place and hope that one of them hatches starts hatching first and i'll be able to do a, a time lapse of the second one hatch but i don't know if i'll be able to predict it accurately enough to to work it out but that's it's going to be my goal we'll see if it works out or not good luck man in the few years i've been putting those things out i never catch it it happens yeah. well well hopefully if one of them starts first then i can set up the time lapse on the other one which i can run for a couple of days to hopefully get the second one but with my luck they'll happen at exactly the same time as long as it happens that's just important yeah have you done the praying mantis before Uh, just in the out store, uh, out store, the outside garden. But uh, I'd never see them when I first put them out. But then the next year, I see a bunch of them all over the backyard. So it's kind of like, I don't know, for the first several months, they're going to be a little bit too small to really even notice with the naked eye. But then uh, over the course of a year, they'll get to that size where they're about the size of your index finger, middle finger, and you really start to track them. Cool. Whether or not they're effective, I can't say. I've never actually seen them work. I just know that they're there. Which insects? I'm sorry. Sorry, I had to try and okay. pick something. Uh, we're still talking we're still about talking about Oh, yeah. I've had a lot of good luck with them for against uh, crickets and grasshoppers and um, against caterpillars. You know, I think they're good for, like, uh, you know, taking out scouts, you know, like ants or, you know, I would say defending an area, kind of like Steve was saying, so that you know you might—they're not going to eliminate an, a current infestation of bugs, but they're—they're yeah. they're a good patrol. You know, they're a great uh, way to keep something out that's not there now. Yep. Definitely agree with that. As much as I love ladybugs, they're dumb as hell. So. Yeah, the ladybugs. I don't know. They—they're okay. They're good for aphids. Um, great, great. I, I kind of have been switching more to using, especially in, in indoor environments, using the wasps. There's lots of really good predatory wasps that you can get now for lady or uh, for aphids and mites and all kinds of stuff. And they tend to, I've noticed, they tend to collapse the population of, of pests a little bit faster. And they also tend to be able to do a bigger area because they fly. And yeah, I, I just, wasp, of, just naturally think they were going to sting me at some point. No, okay, so for those when I say that, these wasps are super tiny, uh, super, super, super tiny. They're, they're like a, you know, not much bigger than like a fungus gnat, if that, you know, usually smaller than that. Will they go after fungus gnats? Because it's going to suck if I start to think I have a fungus gnat infestation. There's some of them that will, yes. It just depends on what species you get. But for fungus gnats, you shouldn't, the easiest way to get a fungus gnats is beneficial nematodes. Sure. Or just make the, the a dry layer on top of your soil. Um, put put grow media like um, hydrogen on top, or that'll work. Or you can do um, newspaper or perlite or anything like that, just to have like a dry barrier at the top, and that'll get rid of them. So since you mentioned beneficial nematodes, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's another one that he gave me today. So this is a sponge. This is how they come. Um, so there's a million of them, probably more. They come soaked up on the sponge, and uh, you rinse out the sponge into a container. I did this clear one right here so that I, I would be able to show it on the video. You could do you know, a one-gallon bucket or five-gallon bucket or something, but essentially this is now like a nematode concentrate. So you let it soak for a while and then try to use it within, what is it, about two hours, I think, Steve, right? Yeah, no yeah they don't survive super long fully aquatic, but they will disperse pretty quickly in a fully aquatic environment. So... Um, you know, you want to dose them and then you want to try to always get the, put them into the soil layer, ideally, or put them into the media layer. Don't just dump them into the sump tank or the fish tank. Uh, put them in the media bed or in the soil layer of your root zone, ideally. Right. And one thing too, is if you have access to it, um, everybody listening, uh, like, a, I don't know. Yeah, like a digital microscope you could hook up to your computer. When you're starting with a new company uh, for those nematodes, after you put them in the water for a little bit, get a few drops and just put it under the microscope and see if you've got live nematodes or dead nematodes because that'll let you know if you want to keep on with that company because 
I've read some pretty nasty reviews about some people before. So if they ship it with like a block of dry ice or some of them, cool, that's definitely a plus. Some of them, um, you really have to, they have to be awake for a certain period of time and they have like a dormant phase or whatever. So, you know, there's a little bit of misunderstanding with some of that stuff, but I definitely hear what you're saying. So you're saying in, in, even though they look dead, they're not, is that, is that kind of what you're getting at, Steve? Yeah, just because they're not moving doesn't necessarily mean they're dead. A lot of them have a, kind of like a hibernation state when they're cold, kept cold. And unless they've been warmed up uh, to a certain temperature, they won't um, really do a whole hell of a lot. They kind of just maintain stasis. So that might be part of what part of what some of the issues are. Now, if you were able to take them and culture them for you know any period of time, you know, maybe a week or half a week or something, I think that would give you a better idea of what you're dealing with in that regard. That's good advice. Anything else going on up with you, Marty? <coughs> no, that's about it. I've got every everything set up here. You can see the, the SIPs over here are set up. Um, yeah, oh, I guess since, since the last uh, podcast, I have a new bulb in here. This is the 330 watt CMH bulb. I think I told you guys I ordered last time. And uh, so it came in, hooked it up, replaced the bulb, piece of cake, fired it up, no problem. Works great. Uh, it's been about a six to eight degree drop, just swapping out one of the bolts. So that's going from a 400 watt uh, metal halide to a 330 watt ceramic metal halide. And uh, so the way I look at it is that you know, that's roughly about 70 watts of what would have went to heat that is now just not being consumed. And it appears brighter to me. Definitely a bluer spectrum. And uh, then the I think that's a 4K rated bulb over there for the metal halide. But it's mm -hmm. noticeably brighter and noticeably cooler. You know, I can, even you just put your hand under it, you can tell that it's much much cooler than putting your hand under the other one. The 400 watt over there, my hand this close to it would be, be getting uncomfortable by now. So this mm -hmm. is definitely, um, definitely happy with it. And that's the Philips conversion bulb. So mm -hmm. it just uh, it goes right into a 400 watt metal halide fixture. And well, that's make, awesome. Yeah, they make them for different sizes too. So if you're looking for those at different sizes, I know they make one, uh, 860 watt ceramic for a thousand, for for a thousand. Yeah. thousand watt HPS ballast. So I know some of you guys might be interested in that. I don't have any of those ballasts. Um, I already had these metal halide lights that I use for veg or mixed in the flower before with the LEDs. So now I'm going to have what will basically be, I already, I already ordered the other bulb for that side like mm -hmm. 20 minutes after this was hooked up just because I was that convinced. Um, and so that's going to help a lot on heat and give me a better spectrum. So uh, with about the same output. So I think they're both rated at, you know, 33,000 original lumens. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I know we talked about this on the post a little bit in the aquaponic growers group. And even though lumens is not a great way to measure grow lights, um, really the the best way to measure grow lights is PPFD, which is photo or photon flux. Photo photo photon flux density, flux which is density. how much yeah, which is how much light is hitting a one meter square area per second. Right, and so if you. There's a number of different links that you can go to if you look at like bulb comparisons or light comparisons. There's a lot of different ones that they've rated different CMH bulbs and HPS bulbs, and there's some some great YouTube channels that go through and test those um, pretty elaborately. And if you look at CMH, it usually rates up there pretty high um, yeah. in that. And uh, so I definitely recommend it especially if you have some existing ballast that you want to swap out, you know, uh, you can just swap out the bulb. So yeah, that's I awesome. Bought, yeah. I bought these, the, the big metal halide lights. They're basically big shop lights. 
I bought those used off of Craigslist for 25 bucks. The bulb is $66 shipped. And uh, so altogether, that's like 90 something bucks for a 330 watt ceramic metal halide. So that's not uh, bad at all. Yeah, if you can swing that, you know, or, or even something close to that, I, I think it's pretty good. And there's probably a lot of people I would think that, you know, probably already have a ballast sitting in their garage that maybe they're not using. And yep. they, um, you know, they work on a number of different, they call them an, the Phillips All Start because they're designed to work on like something like six or eight different ANSI ballast codes. So that's um, awesome. Definitely those are check new, right? I don't remember seeing those before. They've actually, uh, these were manufactured in 2015, um, started manufacturing in 2015, but cool. um, they, I, I don't feel like they got a lot of attention from growers. And they, um, how I ended up finding them was uh, um, through like a, just a high bay shop light. So like gymnasium lights, um, they were advertising these conversion bulbs to save power and so just in that that's how I stumbled on them and then there is a couple of posts on them on IC mag if you want to venture into that rabbit hole um, you can look up this uh, I would look up a CMH conversion bulb mm -hmm. there's 400 watt conversion bulb a 600 watt conversion bulb I think there's even a, a 250 watt down to like 160 or 180 or something like that there's a whole list of them uh, so CDM, Philips CDM All Start, and uh, I know that I posted a link to it in the Aquaponic Cannabis Growers Group earlier. You can see the whole family of them, and I think it goes down to 250, or maybe even 300, something like that. Um, I know I know it goes down relatively low, but for the 400 watt, the the uh, 330 is a, I feel like a great pairing. I'm gonna um, two of those over this. And then I'll have the LEDs on the other side. So that'll be a little over 700 watts of just sort of cheap five watt diode LEDs mm -hmm. on that um, four by eight. And then uh, this CMH setup here will be 660 watts of CMH. So it'll be a nice sort of comparison. I have a couple of strains on both sides. So we'll see how that goes and just kind of do a fun little comparison. But ideally, I want to switch out these other LEDs for cobs or other 315s if I can swing another deal like that. Mm -hmm. Well, Marty, I'd Marty, say uh, uh, keep an eye on that. We're off. I'm doing it. Hold on a second. What's one that? Second. We dug uh, uh, a little bit. I got a bit. One second. One second. Um, shit, where's that echo coming from? Anyways, I was going to say, keep an eye on the grow off that I'm doing right now on my channel because um, I'm doing the Black Dog LEDs against Spectrum King. Um, I saw that, right, like you got right there, and yeah, uh, talk about cool, man. talk about that because we were talking about when you came out last week. So, Fish Ganja guy came out to see me for my birthday last weekend. Uh, I turned thirty over the weekend, which was pretty where were cool. you, Marty? Yeah, where were you, Marty? <laughs> I was taking care of my children. What were you I'm doing? Of one of our children, selfish <laughs> asshole. No, I know, right? <laughs> Are you coming out to DGC? My Not children. To totally hijack the Ganja guy here. Are you coming out to DGC? Uh, me or Marty? No, it's Marty. Yeah, no, I'm not. Oh. My wife is extremely pregnant, so I'm not going oh, anywhere. Oh, well, that's a pretty good reason. Well, extremely congratulations there, Marty. Yeah, congrats. Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so she's due on um, May 10th. I'll do the so, same thing for the uh, cup. Come on out. Yeah. Not, not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah, you still got it's a couple of weeks before, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not about that. She's you know, she's starting to get to the to the stage where she needs help putting her shoes on and stuff like that. So it's definitely uh definitely time to stick around home a little more. <laughs> and you she can't let you go. Priorities like, like fly out party. She can still, she, you know what? She can still trim while sitting. No, I was kidding. Who said she didn't? Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> There's no place to put the trim bin, though. It's awkward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, well, we're, oh, we were talking about uh, Spectrum King, and I, I, I'm watching oh, yeah, it yeah, grow the, off, the Black too. Dogs. Um, 
And uh, I don't know as much about Black Dog, but I've followed Spectrum King for a while. You know, he's got, you know, one of the more popular YouTube videos and channels. They do a lot of stuff. And uh, they were pretty quiet for a little while, but now I've noticed they were they were back. They've done a, a number of different grow offs um, with a, you know, they had HBS and. Yeah, they're doing a double ended right now. Yeah, they did. And uh, so I, I feel like they did a lot of really, or at least attempted to be transparent uh, grow offs. And, and it's, it's very telling. I think they get a lot of good results. So how do you, how do you feel about the Spectrum King? Um, Which one do you have? I have uh, two SK400 pluses right now. Um, definitely like them. I have uh, one Phytomax 1 series from uh, Black Dog LED and one 400 uh, of the Phytomax 2 that just came out that I'm uh, running and uh, seeing how it does. Um, comparing those uh, together. So, um, Do you want to talk about yeah. the Black Dog thing that came up? Uh, I'm going to be discussing that at the uh, end of the grow off, and I'm like breaking out all the pros and cons. Okay. I did have one issue arise with the black dog that um, it's nothing I can't work around, but it's still something that may inconvenience people out there. So I'm going to mention it at the end of my show. But lights are absolutely fantastic. I've had great results with them in the past, and the plants are all looking super healthy right now. Um, now. The one thing that I've noticed is the vegetative state. I think I'm going to be giving that to Spectrum King for sure. Because um, looking at a couple of the plants that I have in the side by side so far, before I trimmed and mainlined them and realized, shit, I didn't take a bunch of pictures first. Um, but the Spectrum King ones definitely seem to bush out a little bit more and looks a little bit more vibrant uh, as far as their growth and uh, coloration. And I attribute that to. Uh, Black Dog's uh, heavy emphasis in the blue spectrum, and Black Dog doesn't go with that as much, but I I'm, think I'm, I'm not going to count uh, them as the overall winner yet, because I know that with the UVA, UVB, and uh, infrared that uh, Black Dog has in their lights, it's really going to help with trike production and just uh, overall flowering. Um, and I'm actually going to be loading up some footage a little later that I took earlier of. Uh, are you going to test? Are you going to test both of them for potency and all? Oh yeah, no, I'm going to be getting uh, potency as well as uh, terpene profiling done. That's yeah. how I'm uh, determining the winner. I'm not doing weight because yeah, uh, some of the clones well, you were should also do weight unless What's the up? clones weren't the same size. They weren't. Some of them uh, were not the same size because of no. the fact that I'm horrible at cloning. So <laughs> some were definitely several weeks older than the others. Practice hey, <laughs> if there was, uh, there was only somebody you knew they got a fancy new press, you know, they could press all the rosin out of it and then you could, you could, yeah. the yield uh, of the actual terp yield. terpenes and THC, the actual content itself. Because I feel like sometimes. Does it squish? Like, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, well, how did that know, the way? Got impressed. But aside from that, I think that... Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <clears throat> I think that that's really the only way that you could do a straight comparison. Like, because you're growing resin, right? I mean, you're that's what you're after. It's not like total weight. You know, if it's got a... Who cares if it's got a 20-ounce stem? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I just feel like you're growing resin. That's what That's what you're growing. Yeah, so that, I generally want to go more uh, more indica heavy for the terpies. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I would definitely go more for indica heavy strains, um, just because if I'm, if I'm going to be using them, I'd rather have something that, while well, even if it's a hybrid, is still indica dominant, so I won't get any anxiety. But I still have um, you know a little creative energy, and I can go for a good hike or something. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I got the infrared thermometer gun out, and one thing that I did notice though is while both of them are on the diodes are around 122 to uh, 125 degrees up there, the leaf surface temperature was consistently uh, two or three degrees higher on the black dog side, but I entirely attribute that to the infrared that's coming off of it. And that three to four degrees kept it right around 85, 86 on the leaf surface, which is what we want uh, in the room with LED. Okay. So yeah. it's perfect. Nice. So we shall see. I got everybody uh, manifolded, and I'm going to set up the scrog netting this weekend and uh, 
give it about six more days after that and flip it. Cool. Right on. Yep, yep. Hey, speaking what? of LED, did you guys see the um, the video from Chill LED? Oh, underwater? Yeah, that's pretty tough. General 2, yeah. So his Gen 2 light, he does a video um, where he has his new quantum board light, and he, it opens up with him standing next to this giant acrylic tank full of water. And you're like, he's going to turn that light on and put it in there, isn't he? And then that's what he does. And then on top of that, he takes the driver for the LED quantum board light and drops it in the tank as well. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> and so I, immediately I was like, oh, my God, that's a tank heater. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, my God. So... <laughs> Discuss. What do you guys think? I think it might be hard. I don't to know. Bring it depends. Sure. Depends how much heat the drivers put off. But drivers generally don't put that much heat off. At least the from the LEDs that I built. Well, it I is guess it would heat. depend on how many how many diodes you're running per driver more than anything else. Well, they're, it's pushing 400 watt quantum boards, so 200 watts each to quantum boards, and uh, so it's consuming a, a full 400 watts. So I would assume it's putting off some heat, but it's it's a because it's a highly efficient driver, it's... Well, you know, the it's issue, the other issue would be you need to keep the lights on for a set period of time. What do you do if the water's getting too hot because you're heating it? You see, that was my thing. Well, just run them during... You have, to put it, you have to put it on a closed loop and a heat exchanger so that it could be vet turned off and on or still circulated. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. You'd have to have, like, a heat exchange tank yeah. um, separate from your main tank unless you were in a... Like, if you're in some places in Colorado, I mean, you could probably <laughs> get yeah, away. If you're high enough altitude, you never need to worry about overheating. Yeah, yeah that's what I was saying. Just really run it during winter, depending on your state. Right. And obviously, you can just take it out of the tank when you know it's starting to, you know, when it's starting to warm up. Um, and so it wouldn't be like any type of automated thing. But, man, it, it would make for places for where you needed heat year-round, for instance, or like Alaska or a greenhouse that you ran through the winter time, um, you know, any of those situations, I feel like you could, uh, um, <laughs> you know, you could just drop that thing in the tank for nine months out of the year and just <clears throat> call it good. And really all it's doing is making it, well, all it would do, I guess, is make your better use of the heat you're putting off anyway, by capturing it in the tank and allowing it to disperse off over time. Um, as opposed to just, dispersing off into the air so that, that was the first thing i thought of when i saw that video was not only first of all holy shit you just threw that whole light and driver into a tank and it's still on but on top of that like that would be a dope tank heater yeah i'm definitely not the person to talk to you about uh, the right tank heaters and you know taking care of your fish properly <laughs> so hey fish what's been up with you oh no <laughs> just a uh, fish graveyard uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So for anybody who's not aware, California was uh, pretty cool this winter, uh, pretty rainy. But then the last few weeks, we had a pretty uh, nasty heat spell. It went from in the low 70s at uh, the highest to uh, high 90s for several weeks. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to turn off the tank heaters in my outdoor tank, the tilapia and all the koi and everybody looked good. So I turned off the heaters that I have in there and uh, went out of town for a few days. And during that time, uh, the temperature immediately dropped from the 90s back down to like the 40s during the night. So that sudden temperature change uh, killed like 20 of my koi, which I was very unhappy about because the tilapia are expendable. They're food. I named them food one through food 30. And mm -hmm. the koi are the ones that were the keepers, the pets that would come up and let me hand feed them because they have no survival instinct. But yeah, that was... Uh, <laughs> That was a little bit of a bummer when I saw those uh, corpses in there. A little less than happy. Moral of the story, never leave home. <laughs> when you're in flower. When you're in flower, never leave home. <laughs> he's, he's paid the fish ganja guy has had that issue multiple times. Fudge. No, it's true. It's happened to me too. Like, <clears throat> last year in my outdoor, I, I ended up having to go out of town like back to back unplanned so i had to go out of town at first because my little brother-in-law who 
he lived with me from like 14 to 20 or something like that, uh, decided he was going to enlist in the army uh -oh. and needed help like getting stuff back and forth. So I spent like three days helping him get his stuff together and get him off to where he needed to be. And so I was gone for three days on that. And, uh, and then I got back and a couple of days later, I ended up having to go out of town again to go to a funeral. And so altogether there was like, you know, six to seven days cause I was back for a day and then left. But, uh, basically my pH got way out of balance because my neighbor was watching my system for me. And he, you know, basically I was like, look, just feed the fish. Like everything else will be fine. You know, just feed the fish. Like I, that's all I really want you to do. Keep an eye on the plants, you know, make sure nothing blows over or, you know, water falling out on the ground or something. Um, you know, for the most part, just feed the fish. But of course I come back and the first thing I notice is like, all of the tanks are completely full of water, like completely full. And I've been gone long enough to know that I should have lost a considerable amount of evaporation to evaporation in, in the plants just drinking. Um, yeah. You know, that's you know pretty much the first thing I thought I'd have to do when I got there. So immediately I was like, uh, why are all the tanks full? And he's like, oh, I filled them all up for you. And uh, that'd be great, except for my well water is like 8.5 pH. So... Oh fuck! It yeah. So my pH skyrocketed in all my tanks. Uh, you know, all of my like calcium was super high because uh, my well water has lots of calcium carbonate in it. So yeah. it uh, <laughs> it basically put me probably I lost about a solid two weeks worth of veg time where they they went in went into lockout and then by the time they came out of lockout and started growing again, um, I lost considerable amount of growth but at least i was in veg not flower because obviously that recover yeah that would have been worse but uh it still turned out relatively good just smaller size plants overall so for most people don't know um uh, steve i think you're i told you about it i was furious about it marty i don't think i told you so i haven't i don't think i've had one grow where something really funky did not happen at some point during flower and this last time was no exception I was doing a three-week flush and just about two weeks into the flush I was unaware of this but my uh, uh, surge protector slash timer for two of my three lights um, broke so uh, two of my three lights were on for 24 hours a day for like five days, uh, like halfway through flush. So I finally discovered that I wasn't quite sure if the plants were more stressed or I was. It was a little sketchy, but everything came through all right. But yeah, I have just a curse during flower, so I'm not gonna leave the, the location for uh, a couple weeks at that point. <laughs> Trap. Oh Don't yeah, sleeping in there. <laughs> You'll tell yourself it'll be fine. It's a trap. Yeah. Yep. Women be warned. The plants come first. <laughs> so, well, dude, I love my ladies. Right. Everybody needs a harem. Mm hmm. What else yeah. is new with you, uh, Ganja Guy? Uh, not too much, man. Just the grow off. Um, uh, just finished uh, the funerals for all my koi and. That's not it. You're doing a little phenom hunting too, yeah? Oh, yeah. Uh, always doing that. Um, so when I finally uh, am able to go somewhat commercial, uh, I've got some good mothers on deck. Um, I actually just popped another six Afghanimal seeds from in-house genetics uh, that I acquired at the Neptune Seed Bank. And uh, I'm going to finish hunting through those because um, the one that I have up here is just a great mother. And then I've got some stuff from uh, a breeder from Humble Seed Organization known as 42. Um, I got his Cross of the Titans that I'm testing out. It's, uh, oh God, what is it? It's Clash of the Titans, which is Medusa, crossed with Bubblegum. And he's the grower of the uh, Emerald Cup winning Best Shit Ever. Um, that's what it's crossed with. So I'm really looking forward to that. Then I've got Geist Grow OG. I've got... Um, 
glazed black cherries from Keith Sweat, and from Andromeda Genetics, I've got uh, what the hell is it? Joey No Socks coming up, and then right now I'm going through a bunch of crystal cookies from In-House Genetics, which is platinum cookies crossed with monster cookies, I think. No, animal cookies. And um, oh, what the hell else is in there? Uh, I think that's all I'm uh, really pheno hunting right now. Everything else is just regrow from the last one. Good. I got a little phenom hunting. Well, we got a, we're starting to get established down in, in San Diego now. We uh, got a little project we're working on down there and a new uh, new little company down there. We just got a, setting up the lab now. We just got a rosin press and um, we've been uh, doing some phenom hunting for our medical grow as well, which is kind of fun. We got uh, quite a few different strains going right now trying to see what's good, you know, 70% of those seeds will get trashed after a couple of weeks once we, you know, see how they do. So composted, composted later yeah. this year. Well, you know what we do? I'm the one that you gave me, Steve. I'm going to be pheno hunting that Shirley Temple. Yeah, dude. That, that one's one? a really good one. Nice high CBD, high THC. So uh, was that um, like Charlotte's Web and uh, was it um, Afghan One or Cherry Kandahar or something like that? Yeah. It's the parent strains of Charlotte's Web plus Afghan One plus uh, Strawberry Cough on the one that I gave you. Sweet. And then the okay. other one that I didn't couldn't give you was uh, I have another version of that, but the Strawberry Cough is replaced with Sour Tsunami, if memory serves me right. Damn, dude, that sounds really CBD potent. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. The other one is the Afghan is swapped with a Harlequin, and the other one is the Sour Tsunami. I got three different versions of that Surly Temple where most of the parent strains are the same, and then we. So, did you do that crossing yourself, or did you pick them up from a bank? No, yeah, I did that crossing with with um, in Colorado, one of the projects I was working on. Okay. So. I was gonna say, you told me it was Harley. <laughs> What's up? I was about to say, I thought you told me it was Harlequin. So Yeah, yeah. So I have three versions of that. I have one, two, and three. And they all have Wu4, Wu5, and I forget what the other one is. There's the okay. three. Yeah. There. And and then um, the other one, we the one has Harlequin, or the one is Harlequin, the one is Afghan one, and the other one is Sour Tsunami. But I gave him the one that is the, uh, and the Strawberry Cough was the other one. I'm sorry. Um, strawberry cough is the one that you have. Nice. So it was the one that I had. I looked it up. It's the one I have all the seeds on. So it's super good. So I have two uh, bullets. Well, actually, I have four strains that I'm getting ready to feed on hunt sent to me by a couple of different breeders. And I didn't think about um, having those on the show. So I don't even remember what, what breeds they are. But uh, they sent them to me to do uh, do testing on. Actually, if you see the server cabinet that's here behind me, that's getting built out to be the little test flower area. So I have uh, uh, one friend of mine um, has a 3D printer, and he's 3, 3D printed his own like LED holder for like strip lights that he wants me to test out for him. So I'm going to put that inside that, paint the whole inside flat white, and... Uh, build a little system in there for it. And then uh, that's where, I, after I do the pheno hunts, I'm gonna put them inside there. And that's what we'll do the actual test flowers in there. So that would be kind of a fun little project once I can make more room in the veg area, sprout those seeds, find the pheno I want, and clone it and get it in there. That's So it'll be a while, but it'll be a fun project. Cool. So yeah, I've been uh, playing with my new rosin press. You guys were on the Facebook group, so I, so I did like an unboxing video when I got to the shop, and uh, we've been getting it all set up. And today we got it all put together and got the uh, the airline. We had an issue with the airline between the compressor and there, and replaced the part that was messed up with the dryer. And got that all running today, and uh, um, after the show, I'll probably I'm still down in town, so probably. Um, do some pressing. If not, we'll do it tomorrow when I come back. So that's that'll be lots of fun. Be able to do lots of rosin at a time. Thanks again to Pure Pressure. They uh, 
they were on the show a couple episodes ago and um we got our press from them and uh yeah good dudes been really helpful with trying to get that all going yep um have you pressed that with it i'm sure you've been messing with it all day right yeah i've been playing with it all day you can actually do up to 30 grams at a time with it which is pretty fucking cool like you could rail through you know quite a few pounds per day with this machine if you wanted to how did the uh that one thing do that i gave you the afghanimal yeah the afghanimal we haven't pressed yet we're gonna take probably four or five grams and press it and see how it goes but i'll let you know It'll be the first time uh, I've ever had aquaponic rosin, so that'll be pretty cool. Oh, you never forget your first, unless it's really good, in which case you will. <laughs> yeah, right? It's the only only product where you forget your first time, you know? <laughs> and then it's a good thing if it happens. All right. And then I've uh, been having um, I have a little outdoor veggie grow that we've been rocking, and that's been really kicking ass. We got... Um, I don't know, maybe 30 different types of lettuce. I have about six different types of mustard greens, six different types of kale, um, maybe a dozen types of broccoli, uh, beets, radishes, kohlrabi, carrots, a um, bunch of herbs, and that's been really kicking ass outside. Um, Marty, did you want to talk about that project that we were talking about earlier today, or do you want to wait? Or Oh, yeah, go ahead, man. Okay. Well, why don't you go ahead and I'll let you say it since. <laughs> All right. Well, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, Steve has gotten a lot of feedback from his class, from having his on-site class, and um, I've been doing more online uh, content, <clears throat> and that, that's kind of been what we got for feedback, that people want more online content. And so um, we want to do an online version of Steve's class. Uh, and uh, and sort of combine it with the the overlap content I have for more home grow stuff, and uh, and do a class together. So we're thinking it would be a two day class on the weekend. Um, Steve, what dates were you thinking again? Or did you? I think it was April twenty second and twenty third. So it's Earth Day and the day after Earth Day or day before hey, Earth that's Day. That's way too close to when his wife's supposed to give birth. Come on, man. Hey, remember hey. priorities. We discussed <laughs> we discussed which day it was, and if he ends up having to bail out because of a baby, I don't think anyone's going to be that disappointed. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and so we'll we'll get some details published on that that pretty soon. I'm going to finish up some slides, and we're going to we have got some. When should uh, you do May stuff. what? Let's do it that weekend. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, let's do May 10th. That sounds good. My wife yeah. won't mind at all. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Live streaming, just bringing a plant into the operating, uh, operating, you know, room. Just sitting there yeah. next to her while the big... live streaming my death sounds like so much fun, Steve. No, I'm just kidding. That'd be great. <laughs> we'll sell. We'll You're celebrate the birth video. together. It's my only video that would ever go viral, and I wouldn't even know. <laughs> no, that's really awesome though that you guys are having another bunch. Greatest of artists are always appreciated after their death. Right. That's right. I'm sure that's what'll happen. And after that, his wife would surely kill him. Otherwise, I'm just gonna be poor my whole life and won't be worth anything. <laughs> it's like most artists, right? Right. Oh, actually, I guess it's a good thing I have an IT company. It lets me buy most of the shit. <laughs> but yeah, we're gonna. He's got a bunch of content, and he's gonna do a bunch of the live video stuff because. I am under NDA with my stuff right now, and I can't bring a camera in because it's under the company's NDA, at least in the back end. So um, until my medical grow gets further along, I don't have a ton of video content exactly where I'm in right now. So Marty's going to do a bunch of the live stuff, and he's got a bunch of different content um, with teas and some other stuff that he's got really, really awesome stuff with. And then uh, I have my slide deck that I use for stuff. I'm going to alter it to be a little more web-friendly, and then we're going to do a... Uh, little joint web class for you guys and um, you know, it'll be like a two day, you know, weekend long class. So you can sit at your computer, we'll have the chat up and everything. You guys can talk to us, ask questions and things and it'll be a really good time. Yeah, I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. You know, so we'll have that video in here. So if Steve wants to, you know, he's talking about dual root zone, then you know, we'll be able to show exactly what that looks like here and you know, talk about, you know, the, the stuff that I have examples of. 
um, and be able to, to show you that stuff. So my, like here we can look at the dual root zone and I can move the camera around and stuff and I'm trying to get it situated better to do more, more training type videos because um, I've been uh, working on some Patreon videos a lot um, in the past few days. So trying to get the cameras set up in different places and um, figuring out different ways to shoot. Um, but uh, we'll also cover um, SIPs or sub aggregated planners um, you know, and all different things with that. Obviously, the beneficial insects uh, it will be another thing that we can talk about. Um, so we'll try to cover all of that content in, uh, you know, in just a couple of days. So it'll be much more concentrated as opposed to like, uh, like by Patreon page, for instance. Uh, if you guys haven't checked that out, you can head over to patreon.com slash APMeds. And it's more of just an ongoing thing. So, uh, you know, I'll be teaching you guys about whatever I'm doing at the time. So right now, you know, just this last week, I was doing training because that, and, and transplanting and setting up new plants. That's what all the videos are about because that's what I was doing. So uh, most of the content will, you know, will just be ongoing and revolve around what I'm doing. So, uh, you know, coming up in the next uh, week or so, we'll have more beneficial insects videos um, on what then we'll probably uh, you know start doing things like you know concerns when you're switching into flower you know uh, making sure you don't have light leaks uh, you know making sure that you're thinning out or lollipopping the bottom if you want to do that and sort of what the general consensus is about it um, you know different sort of informational stuff for people who maybe have done aquaponics before uh, but don't know kind of the nuances of, of growing cannabis, it can be helpful to just sort of follow along with what I'm doing, whether you're doing your own grow or you're waiting to do your own grow or, you know, just kind of give you a background access to that. So that'll be sort of a little bit of information spread out over a long period of time. Um, so right. that's a little bit different. Um, is there a difference at all yeah. between a SIPS system and a wicking bed? No, that's the same Different thing. Different name for the same thing. Yeah. Different name for the same thing. The the only thing that um that I, I would say that's a little bit different is like the original design for what they call the SIPs, you know, sort of demands aeration or at least somewhere for the air to escape, which not all wicking beds have that sort of requirement. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that I've noticed to be specifically different is that for like the earth box kind of design. Let me see if I can get the camera down there. Or if it'll just freeze up on me here. There it goes. So you can see down here, these are the breather tubes that go down to the bottom. And the idea is to be able to allow the water reservoir to have a space <clears throat> at the very bottom. So between the soil and the top of the water line uh, is an air space that allow that's allowed to breathe out of this tube right here. Mm -hmm. And some wicking beds do have that, but I've, I've noticed a lot of them don't. But most mm -hmm. uh, most things that you see defined as a SIPS or uh, an earth box kind of design have that breather tube on them. Sure. We, uh, we try to do wicking beds. Well, not wicking beds, but we try to do smart pots um, filled with soil in a in a uh, aquaponics and we had issues every we tried it three separate times and every time we had issues with the um, root rot right at the end because it just stayed too wet and as the plant starts to shut down the root system at the end it was we were having issues but it could you know could always have been the soil mix we were using right and uh, one of the things that you do in uh let's see if i here let me grab this stuff over here <laughs> I would encourage everybody to do that does a wicking bed or a uh, or a sips is to use something like this. This is the EM1 Bokashi brand. I've shown this a couple of different times, but uh, basically it's just a, a rice brand that's been soaked with microbes, and uh, you know I I usually just mix it into the water that I, I feed to it. But the idea is that bottom that bottom uh, <coughs> reservoir with a, a dominant anaerobic. In this case, it would be like lactobacillus, which is what's in, in this uh, Bokashi. Uh, so you could do labs, which we'll also cover um, how to do those. I'm gonna try and get some going and have them in different states at the same time. 
So normally it takes a couple of weeks to be able to make them. So if I start don't forget, to add your, my... don't forget to add your spirulina to your labs. Right. Spirulina, is that what you said? Yep. Or you any, add? you could add spirulina, moringa leaf, or um, uh, what the hell is it? What's the other freshwater one that's like spirulina? Um, I can't remember oh, the name oh, of the other algae. Oh. What they, they have it at that. The place we went to go get algae oh, shots no, or whatever no. the fuck. Uh, um, it's a posh. Like a, for a, a food source or what do you Yeah, know? yeah, people eat it. It's a type of algae. Anyways, it's like a freshwater version of spirulina. You can use any of those, and they'll provide a really a large amount of minerals and nutrients to your um, your labs and, and really give them a big extra boost. That's awesome. You know, so that's sort of like a hybrid between a, you know, between that and a ferment, you know, yep. and, and we can talk about, uh, you know, fermented plant juice or extracts or however you want, you know, whatever term you want to use for it. But essentially, um, you know, fermenting different things, whether you're talking about like watermelon rinds and food waste, um, you know, banana peels, all kinds of different stuff, or, or like whole plants like calm tree or a horsetail fern, different stuff like that, which are great. Yeah, horsetail like horse is another great one for ferments. Yeah, actually, when I was at the grow shop today um, uh, picking up some panda film, uh, I noticed their water feature outside is covered in horsetail fern. It's like a waterfall, and it horsetail <laughs> fern was like, growing all around it and I was like oh that's funny look you can just cut down for free what they're selling inside for bags <laughs> yeah. I can come back after it's closed and just cut down some horsetail fern and take it home instead of the bag of powdered silica they have in there for 20 bucks or whatever it is <laughs> I just funny. thought it was funny but anyway that's uh, something else that we can cover where um, you're basically you know feeding them a different food source Yep. like Steve was talking about to be able to get um, more than than just microbes uh, to do that. So then I'd be adding some nutrients and uh, the beneficial microbes to that um, that water reservoir down there. The plants can uptake the nutrients and the microbes can feed off the, uh, the food source that you put in there. So um, and the idea is to, to keep it from going pathogenic. You can go anaerobic, not go pathogenic and, and create things like root rot and stuff like that. Absolutely. You can also have things like uh, trichoderma. They also help a lot if you end up with root rot as far as out-competing it. Yeah, out-competing. That's, that's well, it's also good to use the trichoderma as a preventative too. But definitely. Yeah, just don't go too crazy with it because it can wipe no. out all your other bennies. Very true. What else have you guys been up to? What else is new? I haven't had a chance. I've been so busy with my birthday and like just uh, stuff with the new Canadian company and everything. I really haven't had a whole lot of time to to look at the news or anything like I normally do for the podcast. Uh, I've just been busy with plants, man. That's been my, my thing. I got a whole bunch of them. I had to transplant and get all ready to go and build the rest of the SIPs for and um, you know, researching the lights. So I pretty much talked about all this stuff I've been up to. <laughs> it's, uh, cool. it's been a lot just inside, you know, you think about just what was it like a week ago or so. Uh, like all of, I had to tear all my plants out of here that were all, all hermaphrodites. So from going to like tearing everything out to get everything back together and going again, it's been, been a roller coaster. But it's been fun. The um, the one other thing is I did is we might end up having a quick uh, impromptu show on Monday or some first half of the week next week. Um, we uh, tried to get the guys on from MSP, but I guess they're they're pretty booked solid with stuff this time of year. But he said they're going to try and squeeze us in maybe in the first half of the week. So keep an eye out for that. We're going to try and get a, an interview with them, and and that'll be really cool because them and Kapow we definitely talk about more than most of the other products on here, and we've been. I've been working hard to try and get them on the show and, and get you guys interviews. Does anybody in chat have any questions? So uh, I just, slightly. Oh. Hey, Steve, I uh, got to take off in a second. Okay. Oh, right. sounds like Scott's in the room. I got to go help her carry some stuff out of the car.
Okay, go have fun. All right, later, guys. Cheers. Um, sorry for being slightly unprepared today. I kind of was expecting to to have the guest on, which normally takes up a certain amount of time on the show. So, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> just a little slightly underprepared than compared to usual. I think we've all had a little bit of a weird week this past week. So, um, yeah. I think I'm pretty much out of stuff talking about this one. Oh, one <laughs> other thing I was going to mention. Oh, uh, shout out to True Aquaponics. I know he's been having a lot of cool uh, insect data things. Yeah. He's been posting okay. lately. Um, super beneficial for people if you're looking for a resource. Obviously, they're not specific to cannabis or anything like that, but, uh, um, you know, lots of good information he's been putting out lately. Um, Colin Black, uh, we had him on the show recently. He had a really good video this week on silica. That was pretty neat. Yeah, like I said, the, the chill LED grow lights, check out the demo video of their Gen 2. They just posted earlier this week. They're, you know, check out, uh, you know, even their Gen 1 models were, were nice, but the quantum boards for the, in their Gen 2 model, um, you know, check those out. They're, they have pretty nice lights, and uh, I, you know, they're definitely expensive. Um, but for those of you guys that are looking for top of the line LED, that's going to give you that, you know, over one gram per watt yield in a you know high efficiency rating. Yeah. Uh, for for what you're getting, it's a very high quality product. So check those out. Check out Groma. He's kind of the you know where I got introduced to the chill LED lights. He does a lot of DIY LED stuff. Um, and uh, and so definitely check out his channel if you're into lighting. He does has a lot of uh, good information about, you know, what Steve and I touched on earlier, um, how, you know, a lot of the ratings that they use for lights are not, um, <laughs> not a great way to rate bulbs. Like, just starting out, for instance, like, uh, like we talked about lumens not being a great way to measure a, a girl light. So he can talk a little bit more in depth about some of the math behind that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have one. What can cause a cola to develop solid white calyxes on the very tip top? So it sounds like what kind of? Well, yeah, it sounds like light bleaching. What what kind of uh, lighter you're using, Brian Gro? If you're using an LED or a really high powered um, HPS or or HID, you definitely do that. Hey, MPK, P, MPK Kyle, do you have any questions this week? Or our guest ended up having to, to bail at the last minute. 300 watt LED. Are you, what, what size diodes? Like, how big of an area is that, you know, like? How close is it to the light? LEDs especially yeah, can say, fry your, your, your colas. Okay, let me switch over so I can see where my camera is. If anyone else, else in chat has any questions, feel free to ask or, uh, like I said, the because of the guests having hardware issues, um, he'll be on next week. So if you have any questions, uh, fire away. If not, uh, I guess we'll. I so guess brain, we'll, we'll, I don't know if this is focused very well or not. Hopefully, it'll refocus here in a second. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's not like definitely uh well you know what we could do is talk about stuff this time of year you know if you're thinking about growing outdoor that might be a good topic do you want to talk about the stuff that you're doing you know for an outdoor grow this time of year and then i, I can tell I can't you grow outdoor anymore. oh i know but like if you are growing outdoor what would you be doing this time of year so it's a sore subject no um yeah don't ask me <laughs> asshole i'm mad about it still no, so um, I definitely, this time of year, you know, if you haven't already started your um, clones or seeds or whatever it is that you have, you know, definitely get them started. It's too early to put them out where I am here in Southern Oregon, but um, it depends on where you're at in terms of, uh, in terms of latitude, right? So how long your days are depending on your latitude. So... For me here, I usually say May 15th is sort of like the safe day. 
So the days are long enough that your plants aren't going to go into flower. That's basically the whole idea. If you put them out too soon and the days aren't long enough, just like if you have a short light cycle inside, they start going into flower. And then they go and start revegging to go throughout the summer. And that can either cause issues or actually it can be really great. Um, I know some people that do it on purpose. Um, so, uh, and what, so what they do is they put their plants like a week into flower indoors and then put them outside after May 15th and let them re-veg outside. And uh, so basically they go from a semi flowered state back into a veg state and they start shooting off all kinds of stuff. And that's the same thing that you see back here um, on some of the aquaponics videos, you can see the sour strawberry back there is a, uh, um, has been re-vegged and even uh, this one right here has been re-vegged a little bit. I don't know if you guys can see that inside there, but it's, um, that they get a distinct look to them. The leaves curl up and lots of stuff. But, uh, um, so <laughs> I definitely think that, uh, well, I can't remember that. Yeah, that one's definitely re but but, um, Sorry, I totally forgot what I was talking about. I can't get this camera to work, and it's really bugging me. <laughs> about what people should be doing this time of year if you're going outdoors. Oh, yeah. So outside, um, you want to re your plants. Or if you want to re your plants, you can. But ideally, to keep them from going into flower early, you want to put them out at the proper time. Here in southern Oregon, I my date would be May 15th. And you can check how long your days are. There's some sun calculators on it. And I'm going to turn the stupid camera off, back on, and see if we can get it to work. I can remember what the hell I'm doing. Awesome. Yeah, I, um, that's about what the date that I would use would be second or third week of May. So that's what we used in Colorado. Although the one, the one year we did it, we got fucked because we had a prolonged um, cloudiness and it threw everything into early flower, which pissed them all off. But they ended up with nice dense nugs. They they bounced back, but they definitely stunted for about a half a month. So, which sucked. Um, we had a, oh, following up from Brian, it says light bleaching a form of light stress. Uh, yeah, yeah, what will happen is the plant will just stop producing any chlorophyll because the light's simply just too intense if it's too close. Well, yeah, that's what I tried to move the camera to show them. I keep my LEDs about um, 18 inches above the canopy and uh, you know maybe even a little bit higher uh, if I don't have them pulled down and like I'm training mine to the net relatively tight. So um, you know I would say 18 to 24 inches would be as close as I would put a five watt diode light. Yeah, absolutely. That um, three watt diodes you could probably put within like six to eight inches without an issue. Yeah. But the higher intensity ones I would say um, you know, five watt or cob lights. Um, you know, even though those a lot of cob light, cob LEDs are essentially a lot of a whole bunch of three watt diodes. They're so close together; it's just more intense in, the, in a smaller area instead of spread out. So uh, that would be my suggestion there. Awesome. Um, we have uh, another question here. From MPK Kyle, he says, uh, what is the purpose of a mineralization tank? So a mineralization tank is used sometimes by other types of people that do aquaponics um, to take fish waste and basically put it into a compost tea brewer uh, as far as cannabis to equate it to something in cannabis. And then they brew up those nutrients to a point where it helps break down some of the nitrogen and unlock some of those other ones. Sometimes they'll seed it with a microbe culture, um, but that's what they're referring to in mineralization. Um, it's We don't use it a whole heck of a lot um, because what happens is the nitrogen tends to be too high. Um, you end up with really high nitrogen, which if we're doing flower or, you know, we need to have tight control over that to make sure we're getting good branching and good plant growth uh, with cannabis. So we'd rather have more control and use microbes and just base mineral inputs um, uh, most of the time. Now, you can use it to boost some of your nutrients, but it does, again, can cause nitrogen issues, and it makes it, in my opinion, overly difficult to balance because you don't really know what your input uh, 
you don't really know what the balance of that fish waste is. And unless you can measure the volume exactly of how much the fish waste is, um, you know, you have a hard time figuring out what the exact nutrient content of that is uh, or after, you know, post brewing um, when you're doing it just pure from fish waste. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe Donald Bailey has more information on that. Um, I know you saw you mentioned him. Uh, he says, I was listening to the earlier episode with Donald Bailey. He was talking about solids, uh, they're remineralize remineralizing them, wondering if the mineralization tanks helps with that. Yeah, it does help, but it, it, again, it, it kind of takes away some of the level of control. So while you can use it to boost your nutrients, and if you're doing leafy greens like on a big commercial aquaponic farm or something like that where you're not, or you know, even to a lesser extent vegetables, it can be great for that, don't get me wrong. Um, but for trying to dial it in exactly like we do for cannabis and stuff like that, it can definitely um, cause more complication, uh, in my opinion, than it might be worth. Um, I know that we're going to be trying to experiment with some of that uh, up in uh, in Canada here. so. Um, I'll let you know how it works out and we'll see what we come up with. Um, yeah, can't talk too much about it, but uh, we got some cool cool things coming for you guys in the future. Um, once that gets farther along, the facility up there is going to be pretty freaking big, so you guys will like it. Lots of cool content coming from there uh, later in the year. It's going to be awesome. Does that answer your question, MPK Kyle? Think of it just like a compost tea brewer for fish fish waste, basically. That's all you're doing. You're taking fish waste from your filters. You're gonna brew it up. Sometimes they'll do it anywhere from one week to, or what you know, a couple of days to a couple of weeks, depending on what they're doing. Um, there's all different types of additives you can add to it. Um, you know, to do different things to it. It just depends on what you're doing. There's actually lots. There's a, lot, a couple of different websites out there. I know Backyard Aquaponics is a pretty um, extensive thread on that. Uh, as well, um, over in Australia. I either put it on my backyard, like just spread it out in the in the soil garden. Um, you know, oh yeah, of, kicks ass for that. that. Yeah, piece of cake. Or uh, um, if I'm not like in the winter time when I'm not doing anything, I just feed it to the worms, mix it right in. Obviously, yeah. it you know will increase the nitrogen that you get out of the worm bin, which I generally try to not put any greens in keep nitrogen out of but um that's sort of the only time of year that i put stuff in there that would that would consume nitrogen all right and not consume but produce nitrogen um out of that so uh but you know those are other ways that you can you know I, which i guess is essentially demineralizing it but it's not a demineralization like tank or process or anything you're just you know feeding it to stuff so for it kind of depends on what you're using it for. If you've just got a home grow like mine, then you know, you probably have no need for a mineralization tank, to be honest. Yeah. Mineralization tanks are good if you're doing large uh, lettuce systems or greens or, you know, even to a lesser extent, um, you know, vegetables. But um, again, it can make balancing your nutrients much more difficult. Kyle uh, says, how does that differ from a media bed with worms? Um, and I guess the short answer is, is that normally solids build up faster than the number of worms will, will be able to handle in a media bed. Um, I have had some success with like overpopulating them. <clears throat> so basically I take a whole bunch of worms uh, out of my worm bin um, and just harvest them out of there. And uh, basically you can just take like a, a mesh bag, like even cheesecloth or something like that, and suspend it, and they'll just crawl right out of the bottom into a bucket. Um, and uh, so I'll take a whole bunch of worms and put them in into a bed, and and be able to significantly reduce the amount of solids. But they generally, you know, even once the population of worms balances back out, solids tend to build back up, even in low, um, you know, low population systems. So uh, generally, you want some place in the system solids uh, and then end up feeding them off to you know either a garden bed or a worm bin or something else besides that yeah um, another thing I'll tell you is fish waste is amazing for vermicompost um, I know that uh, uh, or at Ouroboros they have bins and bins and bins filled with worms um, and they are all fed off their fish waste and they 
Um, I know they distribute them to some local garden centers and fishermen and stuff like that. So um, that can be a great way to make supplemental income off your system if you have a larger, heavier volume system and a lot of fish waste being produced. Um, the other one that we did um, in, uh, when I worked back at the aquaponics source that we were working on that never came to fruition, but it was something that we were trying to put together was there was a big aquaculture company called Beaver Creek Fish Farms that happened to be located nearby. And uh, we were trying to work at a deal where we could take his fish waste and dry it out, basically make big, long tracks, almost like a raft bed, um, but real shallow. And then basically dump your fish waste into that and then, um, you know, dry it out in the sun and then come back and pick it up. It turns into like a like a potato chip, uh, a fish waste that has no smell to it. It is really, really good as far as mineral nutrients. It's a great soil supplement. You can use it for compost tea brewing, um, but it stabilizes it and it makes it so you can store it real easily without having the stinky sludge around. Um, but when you dehydrate it, it works really good. Uh, it's an amazing fertilizer. It's, um, in my opinion, that works a little bit better if you're going to do mineralization. Uh, I noticed it doesn't spike the nitrogen quite the same when you remineral when you uh, wet it down um, so that can be a, a great way to where you can bag it up and sell it as you know if you want to have you know if you've got a bigger business or even just use it in your soil garden you know it's great it's great for your right soil garden. and uh, what I do is um, you know obviously I'm aware of when I put the you know the, the fish waste in the worm bin and when I'm not and I I do have some separate ones like I have one that I use just for like long clippings and different stuff that uh you know that in any green waste that i don't want to put in the what i call the flower bin um so it, everything that you know basically that is fruit or flowered at one point and is waste from that i, I put into the the flower bin and uh then i have greens or clippings or different stuff like that so and then uh what don't you put in the in your compost i know i we don't put in um, nightshades or avocado um Potato skins are another one that's a no-no. Uh, what, yeah, what are some of the other things that you avoid for those of you that aren't aware? I don't do any. Um, I don't do any sort of like manure, you know. So I'm not putting uh, chicken poop in there or um, anything like that. Uh, you know, nothing from anything warm-blooded, basically. Uh, so fish waste is about the only poop that ever ends up there. Unless you got worm poop, obviously. Um, so I uh, no meat, so nothing that's been cooked, no raw meat, uh, you know. Um, so don't don't do any anything. Like, oh, some stuff that you would normally do in like a, a big ground compost or a big barrel or something like that. Um, I would say those are about the only things I avoid. I do avoid uh, orange peels in large quantities. I don't I don't mind like you know an orange every now and again or like. You know, if you get a bag of oranges at the store, I would eat them all at once and then throw them all in at one time. You know, I, I try to uh, only do a, a few of those. And that's just because they, you know, obviously they're they're citric, um, which contains citric acid. And you can definitely, a, a lot of them can cause an issue in there. So um, the other thing I do make out of them is a cleaner. So, you know, kind of like you have orange clean you buy at the store. Um, and I'll get too too technical with it, but basically you can soak it in vinegar and then dilute it, and it's basically the same thing. So um, you can look up a lot of different process for how to do that, but that's uh, that's what I do. Cool. Does anybody else in chat have any other questions? All righty. I think that was a pretty good show considering this started off with the guest having technical issues and having to push back a week. So Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Let's talk about a lot of different topics and stuff today and you got you got to show off all your beneficial bugs. For those of you guys that don't know, uh, as far as beneficial bugs, the biggest producer of beneficial bugs in North America is Disney. Uh, Disney uses only beneficial bugs that are bred through their own program for insect control in all their parks. Um, they also, I think, sell to Six Flags and some of the other big uh, um, amusement parks. Um, but they're the the one, people in North America with the biggest insect program, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, they sell to a lot of the, the big distributors, too. So yep. a lot of the companies, like a lot of the big companies that, that resell them, you know, have sourced them from, from Disney to start with. So they do a lot of great stuff, actually. Yeah. 
yeah, it's really cool to see, you know, a handful of big companies actually giving a shit and uh, spending money on on long term control that way. And, you know, when you when you do that scale of it, you end up saving a lot of money because it's when you're doing it on that scale, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than trying to spray that kind of square that acreage. You know, oh, think God, about how many trillions of dollars or th millions and billions of dollars it would take to to do insect spraying all the time, not to mention the liability of the like, chemical reactions to any of those, you know. Yeah, it's crazy. Lady, ladybug ain't gonna cause you to have a chemical reaction, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, the worst you're gonna have to do is sweep some up off the floor. You know what I'm saying? Right. Or fish them out of your grow lights. <laughs> Luckily, all these, because of the shape of the hood, they just fall right down. So. Yeah. Well, they don't. You don't have glass over them. No. No, they're just open. Oh, okay. Alrighty. Do you want to? Uh, Plug your channel and everything, and we'll wrap things up. Oh, yeah. So, uh, AP Meds, uh, you can find me on Patreon. Uh, so, patreon.com slash AP Meds. Um, YouTube channel is AP Meds. Uh, hit, hit us up on the Aquaponic Cannabis Growers Group. Um, we've been getting a lot of new members in there, so that's been really great to, to see more people in there. And hopefully, we'll, you know, we've been seeing consistent people. Um, on the uh, on the podcast, so that's been great. Uh, NP Kyle or NPK Kyle, thanks for dropping in. Yeah, Frank, always good to see you, man. Heck yeah, yeah. Marty and I are trying. Yeah, to, much, you know? We're trying to be better about not missing Thursdays and stuff, or at least doing once a week. Uh, we're gonna end up having to shuffle around a little bit because of some of these guests. We're trying to get some cooler guests on the show, in case you guys haven't noticed, especially this year. In the last couple of months, the last couple of months, we've had a lot of really amazing guests on the show, um, and we're trying to keep that going. So sometimes it might be shifted from Thursdays, but we're doing our best to to keep it on Thursdays. So please bear with us if uh, we end up moving it around a little. But if it if we do, it'll be for a good reason. And um, check out uh, my channel. I got a potent ponics. I've been releasing a bunch of cool little videos. I took well the uh, last trip I was at Ouroboros. Um, yeah, those are cool. The shrimp video, man, I like that. Yeah, so feel free to check those out. Go over to Ouroboros.com, check it out. Uh, I teach classes over there, the cannabis class and the medicinal herb class. Um, uh, they also have a farm class and some other cool stuff. Be sure to go check them out. And uh, I teach a couple of the classes for them. And then um, trying to think what else there is. I think that's about it. Um, oh, uh, come out to Do Grow Show or the Do Grows Cup if you guys want to come meet me. Uh, I will be out at the Dude Grows Cup um, along they with Fish Ganja Guy. What's up? It's a private event. They can't. They can't come. No, no, no. You can. Uh, that was a misunderstanding. You can. Well, yeah. Technically, it's a private event, but you can go on their website and uh, and uh, become a judge if you want to. Um, oh, you just have to be a member of. How they're doing it is you have to be a member of the website, which you know, then you're a member of their membership or whatever. Just it's just a loophole with the. Uh, I thought that's what Scotty said when he was on here. So, no, if you, yeah, okay. it was just a miscommunication on that. So, but yeah, if you're interested, uh, come to the Dude Gross Cup. Yeah, go to the Dude Gross Cup if you're interested in uh, getting together, uh, or if you're in Colorado and you uh, want to go uh, throw down against some other big growers. Um, there may or may not be some aquaponic herb that appears there, and. Uh, I know Ganja Guy is entering some. We'll see if some uh, doesn't magically fall from the sky there too. Let's we'll see how that makes it there. So, um, yeah, let me uh, let me know if you guys want to meet me there, and and we'll check, we'll kick it. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining the show again. Uh, sorry about the guests, and we'll have uh, uh, one maybe two shows next week because of the guests. Um, if we do do an, an off whack show, it'll probably be abbreviated. So. I appreciate everyone for coming out and I uh, look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks a lot. See you later. Peace.